Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. A copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource list and an on-demand version of the webinar will be available approximately one hour from the conclusion of the session and can be accessed using the same audience link that was previously sent to you. If you would like to receive CLE credit, please fill out the survey on your screen. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them through the private Q&A widget without disturbance to the program. We will try to answer these at the end of the webinar, but if a more detailed answer is needed or we run out of time, it'll be answered later via email. Lastly, if you're having technical issues, you can find answers to common technical troubles located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen, or you may submit a question via the Q&A widget. As a reminder, this call is for general information purposes only and should, on, and should not be regarded as legal advice. As always, you should contact your voice attorney if you would like more information or have questions. And now for opening remarks and introductions, I'd like to turn the call over to Adam Brandt, partner at Boris Aider, Seymour and Peace. Thank you and, and welcome everybody. We're thrilled you're with us this afternoon. We, we think we have a informative and timely program. Um, as a, another housekeeping item or, or kind of a further to Sarah's comments, please don't hesitate to ask us any questions. Uh, joining me today are one Betsy Fair, who has been with us for 30 plus years practicing in the securities area and corporate governance. Uh, she's going to talk about the smaller reporting companies generally and how the rules apply. Adam Miller, who is the co-chair of our public company subgroup here at Boris, um, and we'll be talking about the compensation actually paid in its calculation. And Chad Reynolds, who is also co-chair of our public company subgroup, and we'll be talking about the various measures of performance. Um, in my haste to get started, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Adam Brandt. I'm the chair of the corporate practice here at Boris. Uh, and again, we welcome you. We're just thrilled you're here with us today, and we hope this is informative. Today, we're going to try to keep this as informal as we can. We're going to go over an overview of the rules, each of us uh, hitting on the topics that, that I just discussed. Uh, then we're going to have some kind of practical considerations, which we, we hope are you know kind of to-do lists as we move forward in, in the implementation of the rules this proxy season. And then finally, we'll have a Q&A. So with that, I'll, I'll kick it off with perhaps the easiest part of the disclosure, uh, kind of talking about the what, whens, and, and wheres without getting into some of the details. But as you guys will all recall, back in 2010, Congress enacted the Dodd-Frank Act, which mandated these pay versus performance disclosures. It took a while. Uh, in 2015, the SEC put forth proposed rules. Um, those were not acted upon. Uh, or finalized. Then this year, the SEC reopened the comment period on those proposed rules and in August adopted final rules. Those rules are set forth in item 402V of Regulation SK, which you know item 402 you guys are all too familiar with, uh, just adding one more provision. Uh, the pay versus performance disclosure must be provided in all information statements and proxy statements in which item 402 executive compensation disclosure is required. Uh, the disclosure won't be incorporated automatically into your Securities Act and Exchange Act reports unless you do so specifically and incorporate it by reference. So, you know, the kind of the takeaway is information statements from proxy statements, really proxy statements in which you have item 402 disclosure. Uh, when do you need to comply? You need to comply for all proxy statements and information statements for fiscal years ending on or after I guess it's Friday of this week, December 16th, 2022. So your 2023 proxy statement. Uh, so the rules are, are quickly approaching. Which companies are subject to the rules? Uh, basically all companies with a class of securities registered under section 12 of the Exchange Act, other than emerging growth companies, foreign private issuers and registered investment companies. As Betsy is going to discuss in, in more detail, the smaller reporting companies are subject to scaled disclosure requirements that are phased in over time. Moving on to kind of the where. Where is the disclosure required or the location of the disclosure in the proxy statement? The rules um, do not specify where the pay versus performance disclosure must be located. And, and there's been a lot of discussion about this. I mean, many companies have talked about or, or and commentators have talked about, will it be included in the CDNA? But 
you know, when you consider that, there are a couple of things to consider, one of which the SEC noted, which is, you know, is this really going to assist the shareholders in understanding the company's compensation decisions as described in the CDNA, uh, or whether the information included in the pay versus performance disclosures included or is inconsistent, rather, with the disclosure in the CDNA, uh, which would be confusing to the shareholders. Obviously, the hope is and the intention is that it's consistent. Uh, but another reason why some companies are going to shy away from including it in the CDNA, and frankly, we think probably more will, will not, is that to avoid incorporation by reference into your 10K. Uh, so the, 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 the takeaway from this slide, I think, is you're probably going to see this disclosure outside of the CDNA, probably following the executive compensation tables. Um, and, you know, over time, that may morph. It will depend on, on how this disclosure ends up being uh, you know, work together and integrated with the CDNA to a certain extent. But I think this year you're going to see companies take a relatively conservative approach on this. Uh, just a, a kind of a housekeeping note that the pay versus, per, per, pay versus performance disclosure must be tagged using the inline XBRL. So now that we've gone through the, the location of the disclosure, what's the format? Well, you know, unlike the location where it's kind of where you want it to be and where you think it's most consistent and best for your uh, explaining your, your relationship and linkage between compensation and performance um, and consistent with C with the CDNA, there, there is, at least in one respect, more prescription or a more prescribed approach with respect to the format of the disclosure. Um, the, the new rules have a pay versus performance table. I'm sorry, I got a little ahead of myself there. Uh, the pay versus performance table, which is going to take a fair bit of time and effort due to the historical calculations, which Adam will get into in more detail, is prescribed. It's kind of like your summary compensation table. You have to use this table. Uh, there are some nuances if you have more than one uh, principal executive officer and, or, and you have additional company measures, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the format is the format, and, and you must use that. Um, but this is something that you know most registrants are familiar with, obviously, given the, the various tables that are required. The, the, there's two other uh, pieces of disclosure that are not as prescriptive. The uh, description of the relationship between pay and performance, which requires, and again, Adam and, and Chad will go into this in more detail, which requires companies to describe the relationship between compensation actually paid, uh, which is a term of art here uh, and complicated and complex, and um, the average compensation actually paid to the other NEOs. So compensation actually paid to the, to the CEO, compensation, the average to the uh, other named executive officers, the relationship between that and company performance with respect to total shareholder return uh, net income and the company selected financial performance measure. That can that there's no there's no required format for that. It can be in a graphic form. It can be in a narrative. It can be in a uh, kind of a combined uh, narrative and, and graph. I, I I personally think that you'll see a lot of, of combinations with so a, a graph because it lends itself relatively easily to graphic uh, presentation. Uh, but there's they're complicated enough disclosures that you'll see some. Uh, narrative or footnote disclosure following those, the, those tables or graphs. The final piece of disclosure uh, related to format is the tabular list of the most important financial performance metrics. Uh, you're required to, to disclose uh, at least three and up to seven financial performance measures that you, the companies, consider to be the most important for financial performance measures used to link compensation actually paid to company performance. Again, there's no require. They don't have to be ranked, and, and Adam and, and Chad will get into the details on this. But as far as the format of that, uh, they don't have to be ranked. Um, there is no specified format. It can be one list for the CEO and and the other NEOs. It can be one list that applies to the CEO and one list that applies to the other NEOs, or it can be one list that applies to the CEO, one list that applies to each of the other NEOs. So there's flexibility, and I think a lot of companies are going to look and see how this, first of all, obviously relates to their compensation practices and, and what looks best optically for the company. Who's covered? This is relatively simple. Your, your CEO is covered and your other NEOs as a group are covered. Um, if you have more than one CEO in any given fiscal year, which shows up in the pay versus performance table, then you have to have a separate column for each 
CEO during that year. Um, you also have to, to uh, disclose the NEOs as an average. So you won't have to have a separate line for each NEO, but you will have to disclose in the footnotes to the table the identities of, of both the CEO and each NEO in that year. What is finally, what is the time period? This It's a five-year requirement, but there is a phase in. So it's three years in 2023, the first year. It's four years in 2024, the second year. And then 2025 and thereafter, you'll be required to provide five years of disclosure. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Adam to go through uh, compensation actually paid and some of the more nuanced uh, metrics and determinations. Thanks, Adam. Um, if that wasn't complicated enough, it's about to get a lot more complicated as we discuss the compensation actually paid concept as implemented by the new pay versus performance rules. The SEC developed the compensation actually paid comp uh, concept primarily to provide annual updates of the changes in the fair value of equity awards granted to the NEOs. Uh, the pay versus performance table must disclose for each fiscal year included in the table the compensation actually paid to the PEO, which is the CEO in most cases, and the average compensation actually paid to the other NEOs. In addition to disclosing um, compensation actually paid in the pay versus performance table, companies should include a footnote to the pay versus performance table that discloses each element of the cap calculation for the CEO and the other NEOs for each fiscal year included in the table. So. Compensation actually paid is a measure of realizable pay that involves complex valuations of changes in equity award fair values. The complexity of the valuations really depends on the types of equity awards granted by the company. Valuations of stock options and performance-based awards that include a TSR relative metric will be more challenging to perform than valuations of time-based restricted stock or restricted stock units. And the complicated and extensive cap calculations may require the involvement of a number of professionals, including actuaries, auditors, accountants, and compensation consultants. And if you have not already touched base with your SEC counsel, your auditors, your compensation consultant regarding pay versus performance disclosure and the compensation actually paid calculations, you should do so as soon as possible, particularly if your NEOs hold outstanding uh, stock options or relative TSR awards. So how do we calculate compensation actually uh, paid? It's, it's basically an adjusted measure of the total compensation column um, of the NEOs that's disclosed in the summary compensation table. And it requires companies to make adjustments to the total compensation reported for each NEO in the summary compensation table for each fiscal year included in the table. Really, it's salary plus bonus plus non-equity incentive plan compensation plus all other compensation as set forth in the summary compensation table plus adjusted equity award values and adjusted pension plan amount. So you get there by adjusting the equity award values included in the summary compensation table by replacing the grant date fair value of equity awards reported in the table with adjusted fair values of equity awards determined in accordance with the new rules. Um, calculating the adjusted fair values of equity awards is going to represent the lion's share of the work for most companies. And the compensation actually paid equity award valuation requirement for each year included in the table applies to both equity awards that were outstanding at the beginning of the year and equity awards that were granted during the year. Companies must also adjust the pension plan amounts reported in the summary compensation table by replacing the change in the actuarial present value of the accumulated benefits under defined benefit and pension plans reported in the summary compensation table with the service costs and the prior service costs of those plans. Now, this adjustment's only going to apply to companies that reported a change in the value of such plans for any of the years reflected in the table. Um, so it's not going to apply to companies whose NEOs have not participated in pension or defined benefit plans subject to summary compensation table disclosure. I think that's going to be the case for a number of companies. Let's see. So how do we calculate? Um, did, I, did I get forward here? Okay. Yeah, so calculation of adjusted equity award values. Um, let's look at that in more detail. The calculation of adjusted equity award values is easier to understand if you break it down into its various elements. Um, you need to calculate the adjusted equity award values for each fiscal year 
included in the table for each NEO. And you do that by subtracting from total compensation the amounts reported under the stock awards and the option awards columns of the summary compensation table for each year. Um, that element of the calculation basically strips out the grant date fair values of awards granted during the fiscal year. And then you add back the fair values of equity awards granted during the fiscal year, the fair values of equity awards granted before the fiscal year, and the value of dividends and distributions paid on equity awards during the fiscal year before the vesting date. Um, and so these three items basically add back the fair value of equity awards that was, that was either realized during the fiscal year or realizable as of the end of the fiscal year. So how do you calculate the fair value of equity awards granted during the fiscal year? So for each fiscal year included in the table, the fair values of the equity awards granted to an NEO during that fiscal year should be calculated by adding the fair value as of the end of the fiscal year of any unvested equity awards held by the NEO as of the end of the fiscal year that were granted during the fiscal year, adding the fair value as of the applicable vesting date of any equity awards that were granted and vested during the fiscal year and allocating no value to any equity awards that were granted and forfeited during the fiscal year. So for most companies and NEOs, the calculation of the fair values of equity awards granted during the year is only going to involve calculating the value of those awards as of the end of the year, unless the NEO experienced some kind of termination or severance event during the year. There's very few equity awards that are granted at best in the same year in which they were granted. Um, and the updated fair value of current year awards should be disclosed by award tape award type, you know, whether they're RSUs, PSUs, performance-based awards, and a footnote to the pay versus performance table. Similarly, a walk through how you calculate the fair value of equity awards granted before the fiscal year. So again, for each fiscal year included in the table, you need to calculate the fair values of equity awards granted to an NEO before that fiscal year by adding or subtracting the change in the fair value of any unvested equity awards held by the NEO as of the end of the covered fiscal year from the end of the prior fiscal year to the end of the covered fiscal year. Um, so, and, and again, you need to include the updated value of unvested prior year awards by disclosing them by award type in a footnote to the pay versus performance table, you know, given, you know, the decline we saw in share values uh, for many companies during 2022, the fair values of certain equity awards, you know, like restricted stock, restricted stock units are likely to um, reflect decreases from their value as of the end of 2021. You also need to add or subtract a change in the fair value of any equity awards invested during the covered fiscal year from the end of the prior fiscal year to the vesting dates, the updated fair value of those prior year awards invested during the covered year should also be disclosed by award type and a footnote to the pay versus performance table. And finally, you subtract the fair value as of the end of the prior fiscal year of any equity awards that failed to meet applicable vesting conditions during the covered fiscal year. Um, so this concept would apply to performance-based equity awards granted in prior years that were scheduled to invest in the covered year, but they didn't meet any of the threshold performance goals. So um, if you had three year PSUs and you're in year three and they didn't hit the, tar the threshold and you didn't earn any shares, you would then subtract their fair value as of the end of the previous fiscal year. All right, so there's a, a few additional um, equity award valuation methodology considerations that we wanted to walk through. First of all, you know, how do you compute the fair value? They have to be computed in a manner consistent with FASB topic 718. The first year of compliance with the new pay versus performance requirements will require the preparation of valuations for 2020, 2021, and 2022. So the actual number of valuations that must be prepared is larger than many companies expect before beginning the process. And like we discussed at the beginning of the presentation, these valuations may require the assistance of the company's auditors and compensation consultant particularly if the company's outstanding equity awards include stock options and relative TSR-based performance shares, which may require the preparation of a bunch of different Black Schools and Monte Carlo valuations. So again, you wanna get your compensation consultants or your auditors involved as early as you can. Um, in addition, performance-based awards that are unvested as of the end of a fiscal year should be valued based on the probable outcome of the performance conditions on the last day of the fiscal year, as opposed to you know what, what your target uh, performance measures look like. Companies have not historically been required to disclose updated expectations regarding performance. So that's a bit of a new element that's triggered by this compensation actually paid concept. 
Uh, certain awards may also need to be discounted by the dividend yield if those awards aren't provided dividend equivalent rights. On the other hand, the value of accrued dividends for awards with dividend equivalent rights should be included in the fair value of those awards. Um, you also need to consider any mandated service period between the end of a performance period and the performance certification dates. For example, if an NEO is required to remain employed by a company following the end of a performance period until the certification date, in order to re receive a payment, that additional stub period would constitute an additional service period for purposes of the award and would be subject to the compensation actually paid valuation requirements. So that's another complicating factor. Skip ahead here to um, the next slide. The new rules also require companies to disclose any material changes in valuation assumptions between the grant date and the compensation actually paid measurement date, which could be even kind of an extensive disclosure obligation. You know, some of these assumptions that underlie some of these options, some of these awards include stock price volatility, expected life, dividend yield, risk-free interest rates, total shareholder return performance, and peer group changes um, that relate to total shareholder, total or TSR-based awards. And the other adjustment that some companies will be required to make are adjustments to pension plans, am pension plan amounts. Um, you calculate this by performing for each year included in the table. The first step is to subtract that actuarial present value of the NEO's accumulated benefit under defined benefit and pension plans reported on the summary compensation table for the fiscal year. Um, like we discussed, you know, a lot of companies do not maintain any pension or defined benefit plans that are subject to summary compensation table disclosure. And as a result, they will not be required to make any adjustment for pension and defined benefit plan amounts. If you are required to make that adjustment, the second step would be to add the service cost and the prior service cost for all of those plans that are reported in the summary compensation table for each year included in the table. Um, the final slide here, you know, defines what service costs and prior service costs are for purposes of the calculation requirements. Those amounts need to be calculated in accordance with GAAP. You know, that's not something your uh, SEC counsel is going to be able to assist you with. So you're going to need to involve your accountants or your auditors in the preparation of those numbers. Um, but th that's basically, you know, in a nutshell, the compensation actually paid concept. It's pretty technical. You, know, you need to get involved um, in the process, you know, your experts and you know, try to get them involved as soon as possible so they can initiate um, the calculation process. And that's my last slide. I'll hand it on over. All right. Thank thanks, Adam. Um... So Adam, to this point, has sort of taken us through the first half of the uh, new pay versus performance table. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll walk us through the, uh, the second half of that. As uh, Adam Brandt noted at the beginning, uh, this, this new pay versus performance table um, requires disclosures regarding total shareholder return, um, particular columns F and G require the cumulative total shareholder return or TSR of the uh, registrant uh, and, and then G is the TSR for its peer group uh, calculated in accordance with item 201E of, of regulation SK. So that's uh, something I'm sure everyone is familiar with, your, your five-year stock performance graph that's included uh, in, in item five of form 10K. Uh, just as a as a reminder, that TSR calculation is the the sum of the calculate the excuse me the cumulative dividends for the uh, measurement period, uh, assuming reinvestment of the dividends, uh, and the difference between the company's share price at the uh, end and the beginning of the measurement period, uh, and that's divided by the the company's share price at the beginning of the measurement period. So the the, the interesting issue here is uh, the peer group. Who is that peer group? Uh, and the, the registrant can choose uh, either the peer group that's used for purposes of that um, five-year stock performance graph, uh, which is oftentimes a, a, an index, um, or uh, if, if applicable, a peer group that's uh, used in the CDNA for purposes of disclosing the registrant's benchmarking practices. 
uh, that 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 decision is going to be one that I think a lot of companies are, are going to spend time really mauling over um, because the the impact of that decision uh, will will ripple through your disclosures and, and the amount of uh, time and effort necessary. Um, so if the selected peer group is not uh, an industry or, or line of business index, um, again, it's typically used in the, the five-year performance graph, the identity of the issuers of that selected peer group have to be disclosed in a footnote. That in and of itself, probably not a big deal uh, because it can be incorporated by reference to a, a prior filing um, if, if it was previously disclosed. So each company in that peer group has got to be weighted uh, according to the stock uh, stock market capitalization at the beginning of each period. That's just part of the calculation. Um, if, however, you choose to, to to modify your peer group from from one year to the next, um, you you only need to provide the new peer group's TSR for each of the years reported. So in the first year, three years, and then four, and then five five from, from that point forward. Um, but you have to explain in a footnote the reason for the change, which in and of itself may, may not be a big deal if you're using a, a, a benchmark peer group because you probably would have explained the change in the CDNA. Um, but you also have to compare your TSR to both that of the old peer group and the near, new peer group. Um, you know, Frankly, we expect that that additional uh, comparison of your TSR to the old peer group uh, is just another reason why I think some registrants probably are going to choose to use um, the performance graph index as its peer group for purposes of this new pay versus performance disclosure. Uh, so the next column in the pay versus performance table is the disclosure of your net income for each of the years to be reported. That will drop into column H of the table. Um, just as a, a note there, that, that needs to be your net income in accordance with GAAP, so, so no non-GAAP adjustments um, for, for purposes of that column. The uh, last column in that table, uh, which is column I, uh, is the inclusion of a company-selected measure, or, or CSM for short. So that uh, company selected measure uh, needs to be oops, sorry, quick there on the slides. Uh, that, that CSM uh, needs to be the financial performance measure that you deem to be uh, most important, the most important performance measure um, aside from TSR or net income uh, that's used by your company to link the compensation actually paid to the registrants uh, to your NEOs. Uh, for the most recently completed fiscal year to your performance. Um, if by chance uh, the most important measure is, as you determine it is TSR or net income, you would use the next most important measure. Um, so while that measure that you select is the company selected measure uh, may change from one year to the next, the, uh, the CSM that's selected as, uh, quote, most important for the most recently completed fiscal year it has got to be calculated and disclosed for each year to be reported in the table. So if in year one, your CSM is measure X, and the next year your CSM is measure Y, the table you present um, for purposes of, of year Y is calculated for each of those you know, three to five years, depending on where you are in the uh, in the phase-in period. Uh, try to advance the slides. There we go. Um, a couple of things to to note with regard to the company selected measure: um, you, you don't need to disclose the methodology used to, to calculate that CSM. Um, if the CSM is a non-GAAP financial measure, which it, it could be, um, it's not subject to Reg G or, or item 10E of, of Reg SK. So technically there's no reconciliation to GAAP or explanation as to, to why that 
uh, is an important measure. Um, but you do have to provide disclosure as to how the measure is calculated from your audited financial statements. So that, that sort of wraps up the, uh, the data that's necessary for the table. Uh, dive into a little bit of detail here, something that Adam Brandt mentioned earlier, and that is the description of certain relationships. In this case, again, it is a supplement to the pay versus performance table where you are providing these clear descriptions of relationships between uh, the compensation actually paid to your CEO and the average compensation actually paid to the other NEOs um, relative to each of your TSR, your net income, and your CSM. So each of those three items that, that uh, are on the, the right side of the, the new pay versus performance table. Um, you also need to provide a comparison of your TSR to your peer group TSR for, for the years that are presented in the table. Uh, as we noted earlier in the discussion uh, regarding formatting, the descriptions can be graphical, they can be narrative, or they can be a, a combination of the two. Uh, where we would expect to see uh, a narrative in particular are instances where there is a, a misalignment between uh, compensation actually paid um, with, with, with the item uh, to which it's being compared that uh, is, is likely necessary to supplement any graphical disclosures that, that might be used. Um, notably, you, you are permitted to disclose additional measures of performance um, in, in the pay versus performance table. If, if you do that, um, it's necessary to provide uh, uh, the information as supplemental, um, so it can't be misleading, can't be presented with greater prominence than the required disclosure. Um, and if you do provide the additional performance measures, um, they have to be accompanied by this description of the relationship between the compensation actually paid to each of the CEO and the average of the other NEOs and this new or additional performance measure. This is, a, this is something that I think some companies may choose to do um, you know, where they find that the required measures aren't well suited to explain the correlation between um, their performance and their executive compensation program. Uh, the downside to this is obviously it, it, it brings on the additional burden of uh, additional disclosure. So um, supplemental to both the pay versus performance table and the description of relationships that we just talked about, there needs to be a uh, separate tabular list. Uh, that, that tabular list, again, this is the three to seven quote, most important financial measures uh, that, that are used by you to link the compensation actually paid to your NEOs uh, for the most recent uh, fiscal year and, and your performance. Um, so the, the company selected measure that we talked about is the last item appearing in the new pay versus performance table has to come from this list of three to seven uh, financial measures. Um, the determination that you'll make as to what is the you know, most important uh, is, is to be based on uh, a look at your most recently completed fiscal year uh, only. So again, it could change from, from year to year. Um, the, the measures in this tabular list may include uh, stock price and, and TSR if that's, if that's relevant uh, for your company. In, in a departure from um, what the SEC's proposed rules and, and some um, commentary that they received under the, the final rules that were adopted, the um, measures in the tabular list uh, don't need to come from your financial statements or otherwise be included in any uh, filing you make with the SEC. They, they don't have to be ranked, I think Adam Brandt mentioned earlier. Um, and, and here again, you don't need to provide the methodology used to, to calculate those, um, but you should consider uh, that 
disclosure, uh, if it would be helpful to investors or prevent tabular lists from being confusing or misleading. Um, the uh, re registrants uh, may include uh, non-financial performance measures um, only if they're among the most important performance measures of the company and uh, the company has disclosed its most important three or if it has less than three, each of those uh, uh, financial performance measures. Um, in terms of the format of the, the tabular list of the disclosure, I, I won't hit on this because I think Adam Brandt uh, handled this uh, earlier on. Again, it can be uh, a single list if it's common to all NEOs, or it can be split up into multiple lists um, to, to be customized. Um, but again, that's, that's not something that should drive your compensation program, but rather be reflective of your compensation program. Um, and, and just sort of last note here, the um, most important measures for purposes of this tabular list aren't, aren't necessarily the same as uh, the CDNA requirement to disclose the performance measures that are material elements of your uh, NEO compensation program. Uh, we'll talk a bit later about uh, ensuring consistency, but uh, you know what you talk about in the CDNA as an example is material elements, uh, maybe a subset of the the longer, perhaps up to seven item list uh, that's required as part of this new disclosure. So uh, if it's if it's useful, the registrant may cross reference to other disclosures in the proxy statement that describe. Uh, his process and calculations that go into determining any EO compensation uh, as it relates to these identified measures. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Betsy. Uh, thank you, Chad. And I am going to get to the right slide, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, as Chad mentioned, uh, companies may provide additional pay versus performance information beyond that it, which is specifically required. And it is very important to, to remember, as he said, it's not, it cannot be misleading and it cannot obscure the required information. The kinds of situations that you may find uh, companies providing additional information is if they have already provided uh, some voluntary pay versus performance disclosure um, in their CDNA and the like, um, they could continue to do that in the present format in their CDNA. Uh, similarly, they may determine that they want to disclose long-term performance measures measured over a period longer than a single fiscal year, uh, so that it would be additional disclosure. Again, can't be misleading and it cannot obscure the required information. Any supplemental measures of compensation or financial performance and other supplemental disclosures provided must be clearly defined as supplemental, as Chad indicated, not be misleading, and not be presented with greater prominence than the required disclosure. If it, that sounds familiar to anybody, that is essentially gap versus non-gap kind of uh, presentation. Any additional performance measures, as Chad noted, that are included in the pay for versus performance table must be accompanied by a clear description of their relationship to the compensation actually paid to the CEO and to the average of the compensation actually paid to the other NEOs. Moving on to the scaled disclosure for smaller reporting companies. In the pay versus performance table, a small reporting company is only required to present three instead of five years of disclosure. Although this three-year period is longer than the existing scaled executive compensation disclosure requirement of two years for the summary compensation table, in the adopting release relative to the new rules, the SEC expressed its belief that the information required to make that calculation for the third year shouldn't be that difficult because it would be available from disclosures of the smaller reporting company from its prior years. Additional scale disclosure uh, is 
a smaller reporting company is not required to disclose amounts related to pensions for purposes of disclosing, disclosing the executive compensation actually paid. Uh, it's not required to provide disclosures with respect to peer group TSR or the tabular list. It's permitted to provide only two years of data instead of three in the first filing. And it's required to provide the prescribed inline XBRL data beginning in the third filing in which it provides pay versus performance disclosure instead of in the first. So as you can see, the SEC is trying to recognize some of the um, issues that smaller reporting companies would face if they were required to provide comparable disclosure when that disclosure is not already requ required to be provided by them in their executive compensation tables. I think moving on to the practical considerations, uh, I, I guess I'll take a couple of the, the first ones um, that have already been mentioned. Uh, one, and probably the most in, important one in my view, is to preview the new rules uh, with your board, with your executive officers. I think many people have already done that. And as was mentioned a number of times, really this is a cross-functional team environment. You need legal, you need accounting, you need HR. Um, you probably need uh, the assistance of, if you have a pension plan, uh, you're gonna also need somebody that's gonna be able to help you with those actuarial calculations. Yeah, and um, I would I would say, while that is, is really important and obviously having a team ready to go and, and well-versed uh, and familiar with the rules is, is, is important. I, I think the next three bullets um, and, and Adam Miller may have a little more to add to this. I don't mean to put him on the spot, but I, I think the calculation, there are enough new calculations that it's really important that people uh, get ahead of the game on, on this because while you're waiting for the end of the year 2023 to be, or 2022 rather, to, to be able to calculate that for that last year, there are two previous years and, and there are a number of, of calculations, some of which are going to involve your accountants, some of which are going to involve actuaries, and gathering all of that and, and kind of drafting early, I think, will be really rewarding uh, for, for, for companies. Uh, Adam, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I know. I think I touched on it a bit during the presentation, but I think um, a lot of it's going to depend on the type of equity awards that your company issues. You know, if you're really in a world where you're only issuing restricted stock or restricted stock units, the valuation obviously is going to be, you know, pretty simple, you know, including performance-based awards to the extent that they don't include a TSR component. Potentially you can manage those in-house or, you know, together with your auditors. But once you start getting into stock options and TSR awards with a relative TSR component that involve Black Skulls modeling and Mark Monte Carlo modeling, it's just so complicated and there's going to be so many um, different valuations that you need to get your experts involved. And you also have to bear in mind that a lot of these experts um, haven't had this on their plate in previous proxy seasons, you know, where they are already relatively stretched then. So, you know, getting in front of them, getting on their calendar, getting time for them to assist you, you know, as early as possible, I think will, you know, make things less challenging, you know, in the heat of proxy season. And, you know, to the extent you can get the 2020 and 2021 fiscal years done in advance of the end of 2022. I mean, we only have a couple of weeks here, um, but it, it, we definitely recommend making those contacts. You know, I think the next one, you know, involving actuaries is just, you know, they're the ones who generally are capable of developing your pension service costs and prior service cost calculations. Um, a lot of companies, this isn't going to be an issue. Obviously, you know, pension plans, defined benefit plans are a lot less common than they were 10, 20 years ago. But if you still maintain them and you're subject to that disclosure requirement, you're going to need to involve, you know, the actuaries who prepare those calculations. So, and again, it's very similar to um, consultants and auditors, you know, they're, they're going to be busier than ever this year. This is not something they've historically had to do. So, you know, getting on their calendar is helpful. Thanks, Adam. I'm going to chime in one more time on this. I, I think the next bullet is also, I mean, all of these are, are important practical considerations, but I, there has been a fair bit of, of discussion, and Chad, you might have thoughts on this one, but um, 
I think that one of the things, obviously every company is different. You have to be, uh, you know, consistent with what your compensation philosophy and practices have been, but modeling the disclosure and making sure that the disclosure is, is consistent with your existing disclosure, your CDNA is, is clearly going to be important. And for some companies, that's going to be very easy. I think the hope is, is that, you know, for everybody, that's, that's not a challenge, but I think that could be more challenging than you think when you're dealing with five years of data and especially in the first year or two when it's five years of new data that you're not, not uh, used to disclosing. Uh, making sure that, that some thought is going, in, going into how that meshes and how consistent it is, is with the other executive comp disclosures, particularly the CDNA. I mean, I don't know, Chad, if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I, don't know, I mean, I'd, I'd echo those points. I, I think, um, and I'm sure most companies will, will do a, a really nice job with this, but it, it is important uh, and, and worth noting that um, as you're drafting this this disclosure as you're developing, uh, you know your tabular list. What what are those three to seven most important uh, measures that you're going to call out? Um, certainly can imagine that if if in your CDNA you're focused on two or three because they're the measures that that are used for purposes of calculating uh, annual cash bonuses or long-term incentive uh, awards. Uh, your your tabular list might be longer than, than those items, but um, one would think they probably ought to include the items that you talked about in your CDNA. Um, so so making sure you've got that that type of consistency um, in in your disclosure, I think, is important. Um, and and so too is you know I think um, some companies have a tendency to 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 see these new rules. And their reaction is, oh, boy, we better change our compensation program um, so that our disclosure looks a certain way. Um, I, I think, you know, certainly for, for purposes of the first year, you're, you're stuck with the compensation program you've already got. The question will be, does it alter your compensation program going forward? Um, you know, my, my view is it, it, it shouldn't be leading your decision making. Um, and, and so uh, I think companies need to be, be mindful of that. This is disclosure requirement, um, but but it's not a it's not a, a mandate on the type of compensation that's being provided. Um, but but certainly all things to think about as as you uh, prepare into the 23 compensation program and your disclosure is 22. Yeah, and I think you know another point along those lines, and it also goes to all of these bullet points is. Uh, and, and this is something that most companies do, not everybody talks about it, but I think starting to monitor filings of, of companies both that are within your peer group um, and companies that, that you have, uh, you know, you, you've, you've looked at their disclosure in the past and it's been consistent with the type of disclosure and the scope of disclosure that you want to make in the future. I think there is going to be value in looking at samples as they as they're filed in real time, uh, obviously everybody's stretched thin. It's a busy time of year in the first quarter preparing 10Ks and proxies and, and annual meeting items. But I think that with this disclosure where there's kind of, geez, people aren't sure exactly how it's going to look. It's kind of like the first year I think was back in 2007 or six with, with the CDNA. Watching what others are going to do is, is you know, provide some comfort. And, and my guess is there will be a lot of people, companies just trying to stay within the herd. I think that's right, Adam. You know, and this sort of goes to the last bullet point on on this this list here is focus year one is let, let's just comply, right? Um, we we know that the proxy advisors, Glass Lewis and ISS, aren't going to factor uh, this new disclosure into their pay recommendations in the first year. They'll reevaluate it. My guess is at some point. They may, of course, they're already doing their own calculations of, of uh, realizable pay. Um, and so that, that sort of remains to be seen, but uh, your point's well taken. Uh, as, as we progress over the next year, we're all gonna get a lot smarter. Um, most companies are gonna wanna, uh, I, I think, move to the, to the middle of the herd um, in terms of what their disclosure looks like. They don't wanna be an outlier. 
um, and my guess is, you know, fairly consistent practices will begin to develop. Um, you know, the interesting question is, ultimately, will this disclosure mean anything, or will it be much like the CEO uh, pay ratio, where a whole lot of noise was made about this when it was enacted, it takes a fair amount of time and effort to pull together, this is going to take even more, um, but does anyone really pay a lot of attention to it? My opinion is no. Um, this this maybe gets a little bit more traction, but uh, be interesting to see how things develop. Adam or Betsy, other thoughts on, on kind of practical considerations where companies go from here? Yeah, no, I, I echo what Chad was saying. You don't want to be in a position where you have to pull back disclosure to get back to the herd. Um, I, I think the, it's a much better situation where you can supplement what you've done in 2022, um, in 2023, because you know once you have disclosure out there, it can often be an expectation um, that, you're, that you'll continue to provide it. So there's going to be a lot of looking at what other people have done. Um, some of the people with the later fiscal year are in a, in a, in a better position as usual. Um, but it, yeah, I think this is going, there's going to be a lot of consensus building in the next year in terms of what this disclosure should look like and you know how much detail it should provide. Yeah, I think the other thing is, uh, in particular, when you're looking at the peer group, uh, when you're looking at your TSR column within the table, uh, you, I think many people are going to need to not be short-sighted and think about let's just see how we look and what's going to make us look the best this year because that's going to it ultimately changes year by year and in fact in the first table the TSR is the the first year that you show in the table the TSR is just for that year the second year is cumulative for years one and two and the third year is cumulative to for one two and three and clearly um, if you pick a peer group that uh, is looks wonderful one year, it, there's no guarantee that it's going to look wonderful two years from now, three years from now, or the like. And then you would be making a, uh, a disclosure as to why you made the change. And as we were discussing when, when that element came up, I think that's one of the many reasons that people are going to evaluate using a, a published index. Thanks, Betsy. And I noticed we, you know, if anyone has questions, please do not hesitate to, to submit them. I, I actually, uh, that's a good point that Betsy just brought up regarding the peer group. And I, I wanted to uh, pick Chad's brain on this one a little bit, which is the selection of the peer group. The, the rules are not a model of clarity regarding your use of uh, your CDNA peer group. Um, and, and their one issue relates to changes in that due to mergers and acquisitions. Uh, but the but the other question is that it, it's unclear, and I don't know what Chad thinks regarding whether you can use your CDNA peer group if you don't specifically benchmark your compensation to that peer group. It's just one of you know many companies disclosing their CDNA. Here's our peer group, and we look at it, but it's just one of many different factors we we consider in making executive comp decisions. Chad, thoughts on that? Because I know the SEC, at least I read one thing, that there's been informal informal guidance by the SEC that you have to benchmark. I don't personally read the rules quite that strictly, but but some do already. Yeah, Adam, it's interesting. I, I think uh, I, I would agree with you, not exactly a, a model of clarity in, in the final rule, maybe a little bit more color in, in the adopting release. Um, but but still, I think falls short of, of providing uh, registrants with, with with certainty. And that is, uh, it, it seems to indicate that uh, you can um, pick your CDNA peer group if it's one that's used for benchmarking. Um, but but again, that that's something, and it's not it's not the only thing, but it, it's one of the things that. I think most practitioners in this area uh, are calling for additional guidance from, from the SEC. Um, you know, certainly this this staff has been and commission have been very active. Um, uh, I saw there were CDIs that came out today regarding non-GAAP, um, and, and hopefully there are uh, CDIs that come out 
very soon with regard to this new pay versus performance rule. And this is certainly an area where um, additional clarity would would be would be welcome. Um, I think in the absence of that clarity, you know, my opinion is the the um, I suppose better reading is that you're you're limited to a peer group uh, if you benchmark. Um, but but again, uh, I certainly wouldn't uh, certainly wouldn't bet my house on it. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I I guess I would like to uh, tack on to what Chad was just saying about the adopting release. Uh, there, are, this is one of those situations where, as we've said, the the rules are not the model of clarity. And going back to the adopting release and reading what the SEC says they intended to do in the final amendment is extremely helpful until we get clearer guidance in, in the context of CD&Is. Sure, uh, absolutely. Well, we don't have any questions. Um, I, I think kind of the takeaway, I, at least my final comments would be, you know, I, I don't want to echo this, or I don't want to beat this uh, uh, to the ground too much, but I do think there is real value in starting early and, and um, thinking, you know, how does this look and how, how does this look compared to your CDNA uh, and, and getting started on the calculations because those are going to take more time and, and, and it's always a little bit of a rush to the end, especially with the proxy after following, following the 10K. Um, so that would kind of be my final takeaway. Adam, Betsy, or Chad, any, any other final takeaways? Yeah, just let's try to get started as soon as possible to the extent you guys have any follow-up questions or want to discuss any of these items in more detail, don't hesitate to reach out. Absolutely. Okay, if there's nothing further, thank you everybody for joining. We were thrilled you were able to, to, to be a part of the program. We, we hope that it was helpful. And like Adam said, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to any of us or any other contacts you have here at Voorhees. Uh, we'd be happy to help. Thank you. Thank you.